first instrument, first guitar? Sure. What was it? Eleven. Really? Yeah. I have no idea whether they still exist anymore. <laughs> I, I, you know, the truth is that, you know, when you get to be as old as I am, you collect a lot of stuff in your life. Uh, I'm, at the, I'm trying to figure out where my original guitar is that I wrote Teacher Children and Marrakesh Express on, all those, uh, wow. all those songs. It's out there in the cosmos somewhere. I hope someone is enjoying it. Wow. <laughs> well, it's got all that magic in it. So, um, one of the things, you wrote a really good book, and, it, and it's, I totally, uh, I, I really recommend you read the book because there's a lot of business takeaway. And again, these are a lot of business folks, but, but there's still that magic. And there's one section I just remembered um, where in before the Hollies, you saw your first American Strat. Well, I mean, um, because we get caught up in the fact, oh, it's a bunch of strings and wood and supply chain. And, but it comes out and it's this beautiful instrument and it affected you. you know? Very much so. I, uh, before we were the Hollies, we were a, a, a group called the Four Tones which is really strange because there were five of us. <laughs> I'm not sure how that happened. Uh, me and Alan Clark um, had been singing since we were six or seven years old together. And we had this little duo, we, a couple of acoustic guitars and me and Alan, and we would sing songs and we'd get paid to do that. Guy comes up to us at a club and he says, you know something, you and Alan are pretty good. You need barking. I said, what? He said, you need barking. I said, what's barking? Yeah, meanwhile, you're thinking, he goes, oh, no, no, no. Pretty good, we don't need no, anybody. <laughs> you need peat barking. I said, oh, but I, this is a guy? He said, yeah. And I said, so why, why do we need barking? He said, because he can play every solo by every electric guitar player you ever knew in your life. And at that time, you know, Gene Vincent, you know, and great, great guitar players. And he said, look what I just got from America. And he put this oblong case on the floor and clicked that thing. <laughs> and it opened and there was the first Stratocaster I ever saw in my life and I was completely in love with it. I think Andy's got a great job. Wow. If, he, if he is spearheading Fender into the future, yeah. it's in good hands. But I think everyone can remember their first instrument, the, the, the opening the case or setting up that first drum set, the smell and the shine. And it's a special thing. You know? And that was an interesting uh, statement that he made that you know 90% of people give up, give up after the first year. Um, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's, it's, it's difficult to play sometimes. And I think that's Jake's message, that you know, there's some instruments that are better as a way to ease into it and becoming musical. And once you cross that barrier, then you're a musician. When I first started playing guitar, I had a Rickenbacker, mm -hmm. a little lap steel with a with the shiny steel front, you know. But it's a lap steel, and I didn't know that. And I'm trying to play a Rickenbacker, <laughs> pressing it down. <laughs> you want to talk about blood on your fingers? <laughs> Those friends have their own zip. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things in business, that, again, I pulled a lot of actually really great um, analogies from the book, but one of them was, um, talk about game changers and people are faced with big decisions, and, and you made a really big decision in some ways. The Hollies were top of the charts. You couldn't really do any uh, better as far as what the dreams were probably at the time. But in, in, I guess in today's vernacular, you left a really good corporate gig and went to a California technology startup, you know, <laughs> with, with really no money. And you came to California and you worked with David Crosby and, and Stills. I mean, all my life, I have followed my mother's advice. And my mother's advice to me as a child was, you're a decent person, follow your heart. It will tell you where to go. When I had heard me and David and Stephen sing together for the very first time in Joni's living room, uh, I knew that my world had changed. And I realized whatever sound Crosby, Stills and Nash has was born in one minute. One minute. It didn't take us months. One minute, seriously. When, uh, as soon as I heard that vocal sound, I knew I had to go back to England and. In, totally undo my entire life. I left my band, my bank account, my instruments, my friends, following that sound. And I think I made the right decision. Yeah, well, it's, just, it's an amazing lesson for all of us.
You know, I think the, um, the concept of working together in teams also was another one of those things I took away. And through those various um, years and many, many years of working with you, always worked in collaboration. And I think in music and business, that's a really important lesson. Absolutely. Not always easy, though. I mean, some well, of course the not. people you worked with, all, like Neil wanted to go off on their own, but you've worked collaboratively, collaboratively, including that involves a lot of forgiveness, <laughs> a lot of overlooking things. How did you approach that? Always keep the big because picture. Because I've had one simple thing in my mind all the time. The music is by far the most important part of our relationship and we've all known it have we fought yes have we loved each other yes have we made great music i think yes music is the essence of what we do that's the most important thing and i will never change my mind about what it is that i want when you show me your best bring it every day okay. <laughs> You know, it is, it is an interesting thing when you think about, um, you know, the, the, the recording studio of the day. I was always interested in, in, in how it was done. And you talked about uh, some early recordings at, at Abbey Road where you couldn't touch anything. Talk about that and then how that changed. Well, the people at Ab uh, Abbey Road were almost uh, leftovers from the BBC. Yeah. You know, and that, that's an sure, good ears in the traditional sense. Yeah, I'm telling you, they had white, white overalls on. They didn't have gloves, but they should have, you know? <laughs> And you were not allowed to touch that equipment. And the only time that I found that you can't touch the equipment is if you sell records. Once you start selling millions of pieces of plastic where you have a certain power. And what we did with that power is never let it go. If you, as a musician, you know, can't book a studio and get some tapes and some, some band members together, you're, you're losing out. We never have lost sight of the fact that we are incredibly lucky, that we do have a certain amount of power because we do sell millions of records, and it's a wonderful world. And you have had great impact on it. I mean, the idea of you guys helping control how mics were placed and the rooms that you chose and the engineers that you chose, I think that became a, and now it's on iPhone or iPad. You can make great music. It's, yeah. What a transition in one life. It's insane. I mean, you know, my first recording experience was on two tracks. Wow. Mono, right? Two tracks. Yeah. Mono, how do you do that? Um, but yeah. And now you can have, you know, a thousand tracks in your phone. Unlimited, yeah. It's almost too much choice you can have. Well, the truth is that no amount of technology can make a bad song into a good song. You have to stop yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Um, what is this thing? Like, we've got a little more time, but we've got to get these guys over the show. But one of the things I was just thinking about, did you, one of your first gigs with Crosby, Stills, Nash, and then when Young joined, um, was kind of an interesting one. Any, any interesting stories about that nearly first gig? It was a place up in uh, upstate New York, well, I think. What a lot of people don't realize is that when we played at Woodstock, that was like only the second time that we'd ever appeared in front of people. Wow. You know? Um, <laughs> good good yeah. warm-up gig. <laughs> what was the first one? The first one was at the uh, Auditorium Theater in Chicago uh, uh, on Crosby's birthday, actually. Wow. August 14th. Uh, we had... Uh, you got to understand, <laughs> we had, we knew what we were doing as Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. We had balls, yeah. right? We even had the balls to have Joni Mitchell open for us. <laughs> you know, that's balls. That is confident young man. <laughs> yeah. um, but one of the things that I loved about that show was years later, a friend of mine came up to me and he said, you know, I was at that show. And at that show, I decided I would become a musician, I would become a singer-songwriter, and that was Danny Fogelberg. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. It's just the connections of all that, part of our life story, and your it music is. is part of our life story. Um, there's a lot of people setting up the show, and there are a lot of people that had toured, and, and just in, in a few conversations this week, there's, I ran into some people who've worked with you and for you, and just to a person, their responses and I know it doesn't sound, mean to sound cliche, but you're such a nice guy. But the reality is you can go through a lifetime of this business, and which is sometimes full of um, you know, lots of decisions and, and forks in the road. But as a business people, for us, the reality you can go through it all and still retain your humanity, your sense of humor, your sense of joy and wonder and curiosity. How did, I'm still waiting to get found out. How does that happen? I, I'm not sure 
what the hell I'm doing here, really. I, I know this kid from the north of England that, that had the fortune to have parents that uh, encouraged my passion for music. They didn't slap me upside the head and ask me to get a real job, you know. And in, in the late 50s, people even then were saying, this music, it's over, you know. They, it's rock and roll, it'll be two years, and then you'll never hear it again. And that was in the late 50s. They just had no idea what was going on. But my parents always encouraged me and my passion. And that's why I'm here talking to you today. So I'm, an, I'm exactly the same as you people. I go through all emotional changes. I go through everything in my life. I deal with my life the same as you guys do. Um, and, but I do do something a little special with my time on Earth. Uh, and I'm in incredibly grateful for a couple of things. One, to be a, a citizen of this country. This is an, one of the greatest countries in the world. Obviously, uh, it does have its problems and, and we're all trying to deal with them all. But the fact is that it's the bad news that sells. Good news doesn't sell, right? So what happens is that you think that the world is chaotic, that people are fighting each other, and yes, they are, but that's only one part of the world. There are millions of great, good things that happen every single day that you never hear about. <laughs> and we were talking, uh, how about Jake, though? <laughs> right? uh, what an incredible musician. Uh, we were talking to Jake earlier about his uh, his, his request to put music in the hands of, of, of kids. It's scientifically proven that if, a, if there is music in a school curriculum, kids are less likely to get into gangs, they're less likely to bully, they're more likely to feel better about themselves, they're more likely to make friends and not get into gangs and be a decent student, you know? And it's, it's, it's so sad, I mean, you probably won't, ever get a, f a football program canceled, yeah. but you will always get a music and art program canceled, and I think it's a gigantic mistake. Yeah. 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 Well, really are fighting to change that. And we got encouragement. We we're all, we're we're all fighting, because yeah. we know, yeah. we know that children are 25% of our population, but they're 100% of our future. Yeah. Yeah. They will be the citizens of this great nation. That's right. Well, so I uh, hope you enjoy the show. You're going to be able to see some of it and see all these folks and all their... Oh, I love to see myself. Uh, yes. All right. And guess what? <laughs> Tonight, yeah. you get to play. On the Grand Plaza stage, you guys, 6 o'clock, be out there and Graham's going to play for us. So you don't want to miss that. Well, enjoy the NAMM show. We'll see you tonight. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Everybody, Graham, now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Can right. I take my seat? Let me touch you. Let me touch you. Let me touch you.